thanks very much, uh, Bob, for that kind introduction, and thank you all for joining me here on a six o'clock on a nice afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, to, um, honored to have been invited to speak in this series of lectures on the humanities in the public world. Um, and it's a special ple pleasure for me to be at Berkeley. Um, I enjoy doing it so much, I seem to do it every month or something. I was just here <laughs> a month ago for something else. Um, and I'm very pleased to be able to contribute in a small way to the superlative work of the Townsend Center. Um, certainly one of the most positive and um, important developments in the scholarly humanities over the past couple of decades has been the growth and flourishing of uh, humanity centers like the Townsend Center, which uh, facilitate the intellectual coming together of scholars with different departmental homes and also become an important site for public outreach. I think there's no question that the Townsend Center's programming um, has been truly pathbreaking, um, that it has really set the standard for and is certainly the envy of um, many humanity centers around the country. Now the conjunction of the humanities and the public is one that is not unfamiliar to me, um, certainly having been at ACLS for eight years. Uh, we've had many sessions at ACLS annual meetings uh, that look toward that intersection, framed around questions such as what do the humanities owe to the public, um, what should scholars in the humanities expect from the public, or introducing, as we are wont to do, complications and asking about the humanities and their publics and even debating whether the pronoun should be their or its. These have always been lively discussions, so they've sometimes required a shift from uh, normal scholarly perspectives. Uh, at one meeting, for example, the delegate of the uh, Medieval Academy of America, which is one of our 70 societies, noted that the very question was strange to him for his research subjects, cloistered monks and holy hermits, had <laughs> fled from the public, unwholesome as it was. But that course is not a choice for us, I think, if we agree with Lincoln's dictum that with public sentiment, nothing can fail, and without it, nothing can succeed. And it is therefore incumbent upon the scholarly community to attend to that sentiment. As you suggested, Bob, the need to engage the public world is particularly pressing right now for the fiscal, organizational, and political stresses bearing down on all of us in higher education are especially grinding in the humanities, fields almost wholly dependent on college and university resources. At ACLS, we're proud of what we can do to help deserving humanities scholars. Uh, we've been pleased to partner with the NEH uh, in such efforts. Uh, we're grateful to have the generous help of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in so many of our programs and operations. Um, and we're very thankful to ha that a select group of universities like Berkeley have formed a consortium dedicated to strengthening our fellowship programs. Indeed, the collective resources of ACLS, NEH, Mellon, um, as well as those of other critical national funding organizations are only a small fraction of the direct support for humanities research and the careers and education of humanities scholars that is provided by institutions of higher education themselves. I remember when I was a dean at UCLA, I spoke to, uh, I was told, or was reassured by a former chancellor that of course he would support the humanities because if the university didn't do it, who would? Now, I, I considered it my task to actually come up with some other reasons why he should support the humanities, but I was glad, I was glad to hear that at least he accepted there was, that there was a basic principle that couldn't be avoided. Um, now, I'm sure, I'm sure I, don't list, I don't need to list for an audience on a UC campus uh, the melancholy inter inventory of challenges that face us at the moment. As the fiscal free fall of 2008 became an abiding crisis in public finance, many have come to feel that we are in the midst of a wholesale revision of the relationship between the university and the public. A sudden wealth of conferences, blog posts, polemical publications on the future of higher education um, in general, and the humanities in particular, suggests that this may be a pivotal moment. So it's altogether sensible that we should take a serious look at the place of the humanities in the public world. And this brings me to the title of my talk. Um, I want to review several efforts to reshape the relationship between the public and the university. My title points to two efforts of decisive importance to the research university. The publication of Vannevar Bush's Science, the Endless Frontier in 1945, and the formation and adoption of the Master Plan for California Higher Education in 1960. And one that aspires to be as influential, the National Academies of Sciences um, 
publication in 2005 of Rising Above the Gathering Storm, a report advocating major investment in education and research in the sciences and engineering. Now, my aim is not to give a historian's narrative and thoroughgoing analysis of and contextualization of these documents. Um, rather, I'll simply take a quick look at them um, as case studies in the presentation of claims for higher education and research. I aim to outline the advocates' rhetorical strategies and the conceptions of a proper and just political economy of higher education that's embedded within each proposition. When we consider the literary dimensions of such efforts, we can see that they exhibit some common strengths. They deploy potent metaphors, they present coherent narratives, and they possess a moral force. By contrast, somewhat ironically, I think, early advocacy efforts in the humanities, which I'll consider in the last part of my uh, remarks, are all too often tentative in these areas, and, and these are ones in which you'd think we would enjoy a special advantage. Now, this is intended to be a practical exercise. I would like to uncover arguments, assertions, expressions that are submerged in today's discussions of higher education. As we advocate for the humanities and for the university, we all need trusty, and I don't think yet rusty, rhetorical arrows for our quiver. This is a special obligation of my position at ACLS, and I think all the more so since I agreed to join the new Commission on the Humanities and Social Sciences, convened by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, to claim a space in the national dialogue for our domains. You may have seen reports of the Commission's formation in the academic press. One, in Inside Higher Ed, described the new Commission as an effort to put our fields on an equal footing on the public agenda with science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. The story was headlined, I don't know if anybody remembers, yanked from the margins as if such location was sufficient to de denote our darn down market fields. Now this commission, co-chaired by uh, Dick Broadhead, president of Yale, and uh, John Rowe, chairman and CEO of Exelon Corporation, will have a challenging task ahead. For while the humanities and social sciences are unquestionably central to the intellectual vitality of the university, these domains, and the humanities especially, have suffered in current policy deliberations, and I don't need to tell you that. But let me just give you one example. <laughs> We know that President Obama is a former university law professor and an accomplished articulate author who, unusual for an American politician, actually writes the books that bear his name. Um, you, he's a forceful advocate of education and research. You might predict, therefore, that he would include the National Endowment for the Humanities among those research and education agencies exempt from the reductions applied to all discretionary spending. But alas, you would be wrong to do so. It is a stark and unambiguous comment on public appreciation of the humanities that President Obama's proposed budget seeks an increase of 13% in the appropriation for the National Science Foundation, which funds the natural sciences, yet wishes to cut the funding of the National Endowment for the Humanities also by 13%. And this is the position of the Democratic administration. I don't need to tell you, too, that, of course, the base on which each of these cuts has been made makes, makes it all the more uh, troubling. A substantial fraction of congressional republics have proposed to abolish the humanities endowment altogether. So one understands the sense of marginality. Uh, and periphery is a dangerous place to be in times of fiscal stress. Uh, the difficult position of the NEH is only the leading edge, um, or you might say the bleeding edge, of uh, the budgetary acts. So as we think hard how best to make the public case for the humanities, I think we might want to consider how those in adjacent domains have, pe have pressed their suit. So let me begin with Vannevar Bush and the creation of the National Science Foundation. Appointed by Franklin Roosevelt as head of the National Defense Research Committee and as director of the Office of Scientific Research and Development, former MIT physicist Vannevar Bush helped assure that government-supported scientific research in World War II was not government-directed. He and his colleagues developed mechanisms that found and funded university-based researchers in situ, rather than recruiting them into the military establishment. His work, as he later put it, was an end run, a grab by which a small company of scientists and engineers acting outside of established channels got hold of the authority and money for the program for developing new weapons. The results? Radar, the proximity fuse, military medicine, and early nuclear research seemed to vindicate this strategy, and Bush was determined to extend this research regime to the post-war years. 
He convinced FDR to request from him a statement of how that might be done. Many colleagues cooperated in this venture. Uh, this response, which was issued in 1945 as Silent Science, the Endless Frontier, but the composition was essentially Bush's. Since its publication, Bush's manifesto has come to be seen as the blueprint for post-war science and the charter for federal policy supporting scientific research and education in particular. Its undeniable importance can be qualified. Several of Bush's proposals for what became the National Science Foundation were modified in, in the five years between his report's publication and Congress's creation of NSF. And many other substantial elements of the federal science regime, such as the Atomic Energy Commission and the Office of Naval Research, grew up before and around NSF. But Bush's arrow hit its rhetorical and political target with remarkable accuracy. 99 of the 100 witnesses called to the congressional hearings considering NSF endorsed Bush's plan. More crucially, the legislation eventually passed enacted the critical principles Bush had articulated, that basic research be unfettered, and that scientific peers determine its conduct independently. How did he package these principles? There's an effective, simple, and powerful governing metaphor that propelled his argument. Deploying ideals of American, national, uh, uh, American nationalism, he consolidated in just a few sentences the conception of the scientific frontier by invoking the moral authority of the pioneer. In his words, the pioneer spirit is still vigorous within this nation. Science offers a largely unexplored hinterland for the pioneer who has the tools for the task. The rewards of such exploration, both for the nation and the individual, are great. Scientific progress is one essential key to our security as a nation, to our better health, to more jobs, to a higher standard of living, and to our cultural progress. As historian Roger Geiger has noted, Vannevar Bush's brief was not merely a plea for funding, it was a program that postulated the authority structure of science and vindicated a specific vision of the research enterprise. Essential new knowledge can be obtained only through basic scientific research, Bush claimed. He asserted that the responsibility for the creation of new scientific knowledge rests on that small body of men and women who understand the fundamental laws of nature and are skilled in the techniques of scientific research. Specialists to be found principally within the colleges, universities, and research institutes that provide the environment which is most conducive to the creation of new scientific knowledge and least under pressure for immediate tangible results and not in government and industry, where applied research was the appropriate focus. Bush invites the reader into a narrative of scientific progress in which basic research, research yields practical results. If, and this is the critical point, freedom of inquiry is preserved. The milestones of science's upward path are specific and well known. Penicillin, which saved countless lives and prevented incalculable suffering to our grievously wounded men on the grim battlefronts of the war. Radar, which helped drive the Japanese from their island bastions. Bush reminded readers of the new products and new industries that had provided jobs for countless Americans and filled millions of pay envelopes <coughs> on a peacetime Saturday night. Science and the great practical genius of this nation made this possible, Bush asserts, linking, linking his cause to the national self-image. But these things do not mark the end of progress. They are but the beginning, he promises. However, the promise is a conditional one if we make full use of our scientific resources. New manufacturing industries can be started and many older industries greatly strengthen and expanded if we continue to study nature's laws and apply new knowledge to practical purposes. Bush's claims asserted the necessary autonomy of research as well as its practical promise. Scientific progress on a broad front results from the free play of free intellects, he writes, working on subjects of their own choice in the manner dictated by their curiosity for exploration of the unknown. Freedom of inquiry must be preserved under any plan for government support of science. Basic research is performed without thought of practical ends. The scientist doing basic research may not be at all interested in the practical applications of his work. But he also made democratizing access to scientific education a practical utility. Higher education in this country is largely for those who have the means. If those who have the means coincided entirely with those who have the talent, we should not be squandering a part of our higher education on those undeserving of it. 
There are ta talented individuals in every segment of the population, but with few exceptions, those without the means of buying higher education go without it. Here's a tremendous waste of, of the great resource of a nation, the intelligence of its citizens. Now, Science the Endless Frontier is candidly an advocacy piece, explicitly articulating and justifying a value proposition that implies a particular form of organization. My next case, the 1960 Master Plan for Higher Education in California, is an outline of organizational form that, with its implicit value propositions. Perhaps the high watermark of a mid-century consensus on investing in public higher education, that plan has been justly celebrated and well studied, especially here um, at the Berkeley Center for the Study of Higher Education and the work by John Aubrey Douglas. It is now a regular reference point for discussions of the current challenges facing this university and the state as a whole. Its charisma radiates beyond California. Uh, James Duderstadt, President Emeritus of the University of Michigan, has proposed a master plan for higher education in the Midwest, looking toward synergistic collaboration of state universities in that region. And its influence has, be has become global. I just learned today that um, the Center for the Study of Higher Education here has been bringing over leaders of uh, universities in China to read and study the master plan as well. Nonetheless, I suspect that the 1960 plan is more often invoked than actually read, although I think it's probably been read a lot more uh, by many people more recently because of the anniversary, the 50th anniversary. Um, and because I know there are people here who are, uh, have looked back to it um, quite seriously. I know that when I first came to California, I picked up a lot of local lore um, that turned out to be completely unfounded. For example, I was told that the whole, um, uh, that the master plan decreed the division of area study specializations between Berkeley and UCLA, that it divided the world up and, and Berkeley got most of it and UCLA got a couple parts of the world and that's what we were supposed to sell, uh, 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 focus on. It's, of course, not in the master plan at all. As most of you probably know, the plan's goal was to validate, stabilize, and extend a set of, of institutional arrangements that were under contentious strain, namely the basic structure of public higher education in California with its three tiers, the university with special status in the state's constitution, the system of ambitious state colleges, now the state CSU system, chafing under the authority of the State Board of Education and the limits on their ambitions, uh, and the constellation of what were junior colleges, now community colleges, locally governed but with uncertain direction. Of course, one of its guiding spirits was the then president of the university, Clark Kerr, who was featured uh, in the cover article in Time Magazine on October 17th, 1960, uh, and described as um, the, which described the master plan as an academic armistice largely fashioned by one-time labor mediator Kerr. Um, who in 500 major labor negotiations developed the subtle skill that made um, his aides call him the Machiavellian Quaker. Uh, um, the master plan was not just a, a manifesto of principles, the creation of a political compact through which the several sectors could present a coherent program that would maximize their institutional economy. As the authors of the plan put it, California's tripartite system of hot public higher education, long admired by states, will be saved from destruction by unbridled uh, competition. If these actions now recommended are taken, California will again pioneer in the field of higher education, its system a model of cooperation for the whole nation. The governing metaphor was the title itself. As a master plan, it was comprehensive in scope because um, structure, function, and coordination were all so closely interrelated that they must be dealt with in a, as a single problem. It authoritatively transcends political posturing, past and future. Despite widely divergent views held by different members of the team as to how higher education in California should um, develop in the future, the 63 recommendations made to the committee were approved by the team without a single dissenting vote. Uh, I was reminded, when I read this, I, I was reminded of an account um, given by Bill Kirby um, of a 19, a historian of China, of a 1924 debate uh, within the Communist Party of China about joining the nationalists in the United Front. And the minutes of the meeting record the fact that the resolution passed unanimously even though many comrades were opposed. <laughs> 
Anyway, I don't know if that was the case of the master plan, but it did pass unanimously. Because of the enthusiastic endorsement of these recommendations by our two boards and their wide acceptance by our faculties, the press in California, and many informed citizens, the plan's authors declared, we are anxious to have them fully implemented. The interrelated elements of the plan were projections of enrollment, the functional differentiation of the three tiers, a timetable for the construction of new campuses, calculations for the costs to be borne by the state and its ability to pay, as well as proposals for governance that included an amendment to the Constitution and 60 separate proposals. The plan's tables, charts, pros, and proposals are framed by a narrative of past and future growth in population, in the demand for education, and in economic productivity and wealth. Student en enrollment in higher education was expected to triple between 1958 and 1975, and this tremendous increase was considered to be the major problem confronting higher education in the state. Actually, assumptions of growth were a bit exuberant. The plan foresaw the state having a population in 2010 of 52 million, which is actually 40% higher than, than it now is. But questions so vexing today, who pays, why pay, what is the payoff of education, seem to answer themselves. Indeed, it's really interesting to see what the kinds of things that don't get addressed in the master plan at all. I mean, what no extended argument about the value of higher education, um, of the value of wide access to higher education. These are taken as givens. No need to argue about the effectiveness of higher education, how it should be accountable and measured. Uh, no suggestion that if there are more students and there are faculty, that the solution to that is increasing the course load. Um, the solution is, in, is to produce more PhDs who will be teachers. Um, and no question about the very um, intimate relationship between research and teaching. I mean, that too is something that is affirmed and uh, not argued. Now, the plan's summary of questions of public finance does leave certain questions open. Abundant evidence shows that the taxable income within the state is large and steadily growing. The projected personal income data support this contention. Few other states have as much taxable wealth as California. The third factor, the will of the people to devote adequate funds to higher education, is a major issue. To what extent do California citizens value higher education as a state service? What priority in terms of state appropriations should be assigned to public higher education as a function of the state? Should the state devote more of its resources for higher education as compared with other state functions? These and similar questions must be answered by the legislature. Now the plan's well-measured well and authoritatively modulated prose presents as in indisputable premises for action, formidable principles, such as its goal to provide abundant collegiate opportunities for qualified young people and give segments and institutions enough freedom to furnish the diverse educational services needed by the state. Similarly, the authors stipulate in an utterly straightforward manner that the traditional policy of nearly a century of tuition-free higher education is in the best interests of the state and should be continued. Interestingly, the most argumentative passage is in the voice of an outsider, outsider President James Morrill of the University of Minnesota, whose objections to a scheme for tuition-funded public higher education, the plan quotes at length. Morrill's clarion phrases, an incomprehensible repudiation of the whole philosophy of a successful democracy premised upon an educated citizenry, a betrayal of the American dream of equal opportunity, to which our co colleges and universities, both public and private, have been generously and farsighted committed, farsightedly committed. An incredible proposal to turn back from the world-envied American accomplishment of more than a century, echo the plan's ideals, ideals and amplify its tone. The state legislature adopted almost all of the plan's proposals, and the Compact of 1960 became an enduring and dominating planning tool for the breathtaking growth of higher education in the state and its fame was already global. The Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development saw it as a blueprint for providing universal post-secondary educational opportunity. And it was also locally affirmed. The LA Times took pride in the fact that the California concept of higher education is the theory that every youth should be able to get an education up to the limits of his ability with the door left open to all. Over 50 years hence, we may feel ourselves, over 60 years hence, we may feel ourselves to be in a much different political and economic time. But as my third case suggests, our colleagues from the sciences and engineering have not forsaken those ideals. 
as they press to make the support of higher education and research in their fields a matter of urgent public concern. And now we turn to Rising Above the Gathering Storm, which is the title of a report issued in 2005 by a committee formed by the National Academy of Science, the National Academy of Engineering, and the Institute of Medicine in response to a request from a bipartisan group of senators and representatives. The legislatures requested that the academies identify the top 10 actions that federal policymakers could take to enhance the science and technology enterprise so that the United States can successfully compete, prosper, and be secure in the global community of the 21st century. The National Academies created the Committee on Prospering in the Global Economy of the 21st <coughs> Century to respond to this request. Its members included three university presidents, several Nobel laureates, and corporate leaders. The, the committee's co-chair, Norm Augustine, the former board chair of Lockheed Martin, is also a member of the new Commission on the Humanities and Social Sciences, which, probably not incidentally, has also been asked to come, with, come up with a list of top 10 actions. The committee had only 10 weeks to com complete its report, which runs to more than 500 pages with a wealth of, wealth of references, examples, and statistical evidence. After this 2005 publication, it continued to press its case in follow-up reports that ranked the gathering storm as category five, that is the level of Hurricane Katrina, which hit the Gulf Coast, Coast the year of the initial report. Gathering storm is, is only one metaphor deployed by the document. Alighting on Tom Friedman's concept of a flat world, the, the committee asks, is the world flat or is it tilted? Many people who once had jobs in the textile, furniture, apparel, automotive, and other manufacturing industries might be forgiven for saying that the world is decidedly slanted. They watch their jobs run downhill to countries where the workforce earns far lower wages. And this is the pivot of their case. The economic prosperity of the United States has been powered by technological innovation made possible by a broad institutional, educational, and research uh, capacity in science and, and engineering. The report highlights the erosion of that base in both absolute measures and especially relative comparisons with China and India. American prosperity is in peril, the report argues, for although many people assume that the US will always be a world leader in science and technology, this may not continue to be the case. The report's many recommendations are grouped under four headings, each with a mnemonically helpful alliterative label. Strengthening K-12 K 12 education, 10,000 teachers, 10 million minds. Maintaining and enhancing research capacities, sowing the seeds. Reinvigorating higher education in science and engineering, best and brightest. And proposing changes in economic policy, incentives for innovation. I think Rising Above the Gathering Storm exhibits many of the same rhetorical strategies as Science the Endless Frontier and the Master Plan. The governing metaphor encapsulates and symbolizes their analysis. The image of a gathering storm conveys urgency, suggests powerful external forces that can be risen above if appropriate measures are taken. The report's master narrative is crafted to resonate with the anxious public mind. It does not shy from using words like worry or even fear. That narrative begins with the rising action of past national achievements and continues to uh, call attention to the risk of relying too much on abundant short-term thinking and insufficient long-term in investment. And extrapolating from these trends, the report paints a grim future that is already present in the public um, imagination. Economic weakness in the US as other nations advance, slow growth in job creation and GDP, declining earnings for all workers, growth in per capita income, et cetera, will slow despite a relatively high standard of living. The storm will make land landfall, and the entire nation is New Orleans. But while rising above the gathering storm is a broodingly ominous um, a document, as ominous as the master plan and science, the endless frontier, are optimistic, all are forthright in making the claim that broad access to higher education is in the public interest. And here's how the National Academies report makes the case. Our, cu our culture has always considered higher education a public good or at least we have seemed to do so. We've agreed as a society that educated citizens benefit the whole society, that the benefit accrues to us all and not just to those who receive the education. Now, however, funding for uni state universities is dwindling, tuition is rising, and students are borrowing more than they receive in grants. These seem to be indications that our society increasingly sees higher education as a private good, 
of value only to the individual receiving it. In the long run, the nation as a whole will, will suffer from the lack of new talent that could have been discovered and nurtured in affordable, <coughs> accessible, high quality public schools, colleges, and universities. Now I'd like to turn briefly to enter the storehouse of efforts presenting the humanities to the public within and without the university and compare the pattern of humanities advocacy with the three efforts I just reviewed. Humanists have sung their song in, in, in a distinctive key. Unlike the physical, biological, and social sciences, the humanities were not born in the Big Bang that brought forth the research university. With the quick march of science, wrote Foundation Officer Abraham Flexner in 1930, philosophy and humanism have gone under a cloud. When they assert themselves, they are prone to do so apologetically on the ground that they too are or can be scientific. Flexner had ample opportunity to review such uh, apologies. Best known for work in the foundation-driven reform of, higher, of medical education, he was also the first officer of the Rockefeller philanthrop uh, th uh, philanthropic uh, efforts uh, as a foundation to attempt a sustained program supporting humanities research and education. That program began in the 1920s, but a decade of foundation proposal writing did not seem to sharpen the public presentation of humanists. In 1939, the president of Hopkins, Isaiah Bowman, complained to another Rockefeller officer that a prime difficulty in securing a proper appreciation for the humanities is the inability of men in the field to make their purposes clear. They too often descend to glittering generalities. Humanists have a special way of writing. They repeat each other's language. Humanists, he felt, were too content with displays of specialization and tended to neglect the relationships of their findings with present life. When Raymond Fosdick retired, retired as the president of the Rockefeller Foundation in 1949, he considered the foundation's work in the humanities excellent so far as it goes, but all too often described in fuzzy terms by program officers. Somehow, he lamented, we aren't addressing ourselves to the core of the question, the spiritual hunger and aimlessness of our generation. How do we meet it? I don't know the answer, but I feel a lack of it every time I present an item uh, on the humanities to the trustees. And 60 years later, the sociologist and former provost of Columbia, uh, Jonathan Cole, used almost the same language when he wrote in his book, The Great American University, that humanities scholars and their leaders at major universities failed to argue effectively and never successfully made the case that wrestling with questions of competing values, morality, and ethics, and thinking critically about these subjects were essential for citizens. How have leading humanist scholars made the case for the humanities? What metaphors, narratives, value propositions, and claims have they deployed? Are there arguments, principles, and concepts from the past that might help us, including the new commission on the humanities today? Now, shelves groan with the products of earlier commissions. One of these is the Humanities in American Life, the 1980 report of the Commission on the Humanities sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation, which opens with one possible metaphor. And I quote, <coughs> nailed to the ship's mast in Moby Dick is a gold doubloon stamped with signs and symbols in luxuriant profusion. The coin is Captain Ahab's promised reward to the crewman who sights the white whale. But in its emblems, each man reads his own meaning. As Ahab says, this round gold is but the image of the rounder globe, which like a magician's glass, to each and every man in turn, but mirrors back his own mysterious self. Like the bright doubloon, the, the commission report continues, the humanities mirror our own image and our image of the world. Through the humanities, we reflect on the fundamental question, what does it mean to be human? The humanities offer clues, but never a complete answer. So, is this an apt metaphor? It draws from the subject of humanistic study, a powerful and complex text, a masterpiece of world literature, and projects Captain Ahab's metaphor onto the humanities as a whole. It suits the humanities scholar's conception of our intellectual project, reflective, reflecting, reflexive, open-ended, and indeterminate. But does it resonate with the broader public? Is the gaudy prize offered by a vengeful obsessive to a ship of doomed men the most salubrious possible image of the humanities? And is self-knowledge only a private reward? Another metaphor comes from Howard Mumford Jones, a Harvard professor of English, a founder of the field of American studies, and chair of the board of the ACLS. Under Jones's leadership, 
ACLS formed in the 1950s a commission of leading scholars and businessmen to deliberate on the role of the humanities in public life. The commission met for two years, and in 1959, Jones published a book-length essay drawn from its deliberations entitled, One Great Society, Humane Learning in the United States. His title, his metaphor for what the humanities makes possible, is taken from Wordsworth Prelude. There is one great society on earth, the noble living and the noble dead. And with this metaphor, Jones exalts the inescapable responsibility of the humanities to comprehend, conserve, and convey the historical record of human thought and creativity. The primary business of the humanities, he maintains, is to make the human heritage man looks back upon meaningful and available uh, as individual experience rather than as mass and generalization. The revelations of life, art, emotion, and wisdom gleaned from the records of men are precisely what the humanities have to give, Jones writes. Advocates for the humanities have often conceded that while the humanities may not possess direct instrumental utility, they do have, as one petitioner to the Rockefeller Foundation put it, terminal value. But Jones didn't concede the terrain of practicality. Americans have developed an enormous respect for exact knowledge, he pointed out, and it is humanistic knowledge that produces most reference books, dictionaries, and encyclopedias. Without the activity of humanities scholars, he asserts, about one-third of our available information about the human world would grow more untrustworthy and eventually disappear. Yet Jones resisted yielding to the advocate's understandable temptation to package the benefits of humanistic learning neatly with a promise of easy and early delivery. Humanistic scholarship both, both enables and requires clear exposition. But writing is not a skill, he, he writes, like skating or running a typewriter. You can tell when this was written, he cautions. It is a totality of expression involving not only the speech habits of the individual who writes, but also the existence of a verbal environment less bare than the language of television shows. One does not, one cannot learn to write by taking a single course in English composition. Only long exposure to the humanities, only the private discovery that mastering the art of communication is in the long run a battle, can develop the writer rather than simply the writing. The humanities rightly understood are philosophical discourse, not training. They furnish a point of view. They do not give out tools and skills like premiums. Again, 1959. The capacity to identify and interpret value has been held up repeatedly as the signal contribution of the humanities to education and to the common weal. The assessment of values, insofar as human beings are affected, constitutes the unique burden of humanism, wrote Abraham Flexner. Sooner or later, the humanist, as humanist, must concern himself with worthwhileness. He must raise the question of value not only in the particular field in which he operates scientifically, but elsewhere. David H. Stevens, Flexner's successor as leader of the Rockefeller Foundation's Humanities Philanthropy, defined the humanities as that learning that keeps alive the remembrance of great ideas from which choice is made. The advent of World War II gave the partisans of the humanities the opportunity to braid this conception of their role into the narrative of contemporary history. In proposing a wartime program to the Rockefeller Foundation Board, Stevens defined the goal of the humanities as to communicate and to interpret cultural values of a contemporary significance. For if the world is to recover its memory and then its sense of values, it needs to develop people who know the sources, the means, and the ends of daily existence. And in 1943, an ACLS committee published Liberal Education Reexamined Its Role in a Democracy and noted that the war has precipitated a reassessment of values in which the accent has switched from comfort and convenience to more enduring values. So the function of liberal education is to make men free and to teach them to bear freedom when they have it. And central to the same was the humanities, which unlike the sciences are primarily concerned with values and critical appraisal. Their subject matter is man's experience of value and his ideals and standards. Now Jeff Harpham, who's also spoken in this series, has analyzed in detail how the claim that humanistic knowledge and education were essential to the democratic polity fit well with the emergence of the US as a superpower and the ideological competition of the Cold War. The argument for a federal humanities establishment followed logically. In 1963, ACLS, the Council of Graduate Schools, and the United Chapters of Phi Beta Kappa appointed yet another commission on the humanities. This commission's report argued for the creation of a national foundation for the humanities, just as Vannevar Bush had made the case for a federal science foundation a generation <coughs> earlier. The humanities are the study of what is most human, the report began. 
Throughout man's conscious past, they have played an essential role in forming, preserving, and transforming the social, moral, and aesthetic values of every man in every age. One cannot speak of history or culture apart from the humanities. We propose, therefore, a program for all our people, a program to meet needs no less serious than that for national defense. We speak in truth for what is being defended, our beliefs, our ideas, our ideals, our, ideals, our highest achievements. The report focuses intently on civic purposes, on America's need of the humanities. Democracy demands wisdom is the report's most quoted phrase and still appears on the website of the NEH. Without the exercise of wisdom, free institutions and personal liberty are inevitably imperiled. To know the best that has been thought and said in former times can make us wiser than we might otherwise be. And in this respect, the humanities are not merely our, but the world's best hope. And this was indeed a project with international implications. Neither superior force, nor vast wealth, or preponderant technology could entitle any country to world leadership. Only the elevation of its goals and the excellence of its conduct entitle one nation to ask others to follow its lead. These themes echo still today. NEH Chairman Jim Leach now regularly emphasizes that the greatest enemies of humanistic study are tyrants who are discomfited by free inquiries into values and history. At a moment when we see a new public world emerging in the Middle East, we realize again that humans constantly recreate meaning and value, and that the study of that human creativity must be equally dynamic. And that is exactly where I think we find much that is to be admired in the advocacy efforts of colleagues in the sciences decades ago and recently as well. It certainly is not my belief that arguments for the humanities ought to mimic those of other fields. We do sing our song in a distinctive key because of our intellectual, because our intellectual enterprise is distinctive. But it's not wholly separate. We have our own methods and subjects, but the humanities are also a domain defined by serious and probing research. There is much to praise in the arguments of previous and some more recent humanities advocates, but I think they generally lack a, a strong and compelling narrative of the nature and progress of humanistic knowledge. The humanities perform vital cultural work, but that work draws its vitality from continual transformation and renewal through discovery, relentless inquiry, and the creation of new knowledge. Uh, on this, I would say that I think in a very hopeful um, step has been taken in the recent initiative uh, launched by President of Cornell, David Scorton, calling attention to the, um, the research, important research function of the NEH and why it deserves support. And the congressional letter to the Commission on the Humanities and Social Sciences also <coughs> says that the strong tradition of research and scholarship in the humanities and social sciences is in large part responsible for our nation's unique ability to evolve with historical circumstance. There's an important corollary to this proposition about the work of the humanities. They can do their good work only if society continues to see higher education as a public good, as a community interest, and not as a private commodity. The research work of the humanities is so exacting and demanding that it must engage the broadest range of talents. We should make common cause with our colleagues in the sciences in arguing, therefore, that narrowing access to education weaker, weakens the entire edifice of knowledge. So I will let me conclude with just two more quotations. The first is from a rather surprising public advocate for the humanities, one who proclaimed that every achievement in the humanities is a vital step in the national progress. Um, I don't know if any of you know who, who might have formulated this a very concise uh, statement. Um, it, it was something I discovered much to my surprise in an account of the 1970 ACLS annual meeting, which was held in Washington, DC, when our chair then uh, at the time read messages of greeting. This one came from the then president of the United States, Richard Milhouse Nixon. Um, now why does this, this does however, seem a little bit strange and maybe even uncomfortable to realize, to, to listen to this, to this statement. Um, as good humanists, we know that any readers receive any text, including this stirring credo, not as a direct, unmediated abstraction, but understand it in a complicated personal and cultural historical context. And for us, that context includes knowledge of Nixon's subsequent disgrace and, of course, the culture wars during which many politicians came to appreciate, again, how easy it is to parody scholarship for profit um, in poll numbers. And also, to be sure, there's, there's probably a not insignificant number of humanity scholars who would be uneasy using 
either or both words of his phrase, national progress. Thus, the complexities of advocacy from the margins. Um, I think that it's, it's possible, nonetheless, to, to come up with a case that embraces that complexity at the, and at the same time um, <coughs> shares with, with some of the statements that I um, discussed earlier a, a, a sense of uh, belonging to some larger whole. Um, I think the humanities can find their place in the public world, and I think we can confirm complexity, but with clarity. And my final quotation is from Howard Mumford Jones, who explained how the humanities enrich both the public and private worlds we all inhabit. Perhaps nobody knows how to make any human being better, happier, and more capable. But at the very least, the humanities, humane learning, and humanistic scholarship help to sustain a universe of thought in which these questions have meaning and in which adults may have the opportunity to work out such problems for themselves. So no, I don't have a metaphor. I think that's something that I will leave it up to the commission to find. Um, but I do think that the, the endless frontier of the humanities is, is the grand universe of thought that surrounds us with many, many questions, but with a wealth of meaning as well. And relentless inquiry into meaning and value is perhaps how we do make progress as a nation and in the world. So thank you very much. <laughs>